Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our next webinar. Uh, today is March 24, 2022, and the title of the webinar is Freedom Day in Belarus, which is tomorrow, uh, focusing on collective memory and the future in the context of Russia's war in Ukraine. I'm your moderator for today, Elena Karastilova, I'm professor of international politics and the co-founder of uh, Oxford Belarus Observatory, uh, working together with um, uh, Professor um, um, Chris Gehry. Well, this expert uh, webinar is jointly convened actually by three entities. Uh, uh, first of all, it's the research center of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's office, um, but also the University, um, or the University of Oxford Belarus Observatory. And it is also run with the support of GCRF Compass project. Um, the webinar, just a few words perhaps about the format, just to explain for, for the newcomers how it, uh, how it is run. Mm -hmm. The webinar will be um, about one hour and 15 minutes in duration, and speakers are asked uh, to uh, uh, go on for about five, seven minutes with their interventions. Um, those who are not speaking, please mute yourself uh, 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 in, in this case. Um, this will be followed by panel discussion and question and answer. Uh, a question and answer from, from the audience. The audience is invited to post questions in the chat function. Just to mention, we also have uh, two working languages today, English and Belarusian for the webinar. So please use the interpretation button at the uh, bottom of the screen if you, need to, uh, if you need to use this option. The webinar is also live stream uh, to YouTube and the recording will be available after the discussion. Um, in case if you need to consult it further. Now, um, to the speakers. We have another stellar cast today, and I'm very delighted to introduce um, our speakers um, uh, to you. We'll begin perhaps with Professor David Marples. Um, David Marples is a distinguished university professor of Russian and East European history, University of Alberta. Uh, Alberta. He's also the author of 16 single authored books, including Understanding Ukraine and Belarus, Ukraine in, Co in Conflict, Our Glorious Past, Lukashenko, Lukashenko's Belarus in the Great Patriotic War, and many, many more. David is truly a prolific writer and an outstanding speaker. He has also published um, over 100 articles in peer reviewed journals. And um, he's also part of our group together, uh, uh, editorial um, group together with Veronika Laputska, uh, the uh, Belarus um, in the 21st century, which we hope will uh, see the light uh, at, uh, towards the end of this year. Um, David will be followed by Alexander Schlick. Alexander is a regular guest of this webinars. And Alexander is a special representative on elections uh, of the office of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Hello, Alexander, again. He ha has over 10 years experience of working with the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, but not there anymore, uh, because obviously what you need to do now um, in the office, it obviously requires uh, your full time and attention. Um, so welcome back, Alexander. Uh, Alexander then will be followed by Veronika Laputska. Laputska, uh, Veronika is research fellow and co-founder of the East Center in Warsaw. Uh, Veronika is also doing PhD at the Graduate School for Social Research, Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, Veronika's uh, thesis um, actually examines visual propaganda at the national uh, com commemorations in modern Belarus. So Veronika is really a spot on candidate uh, for our discussion today. Uh, Veronika also has been a recipient of several prestigious awards, including the Rothschild uh, Scholarship for the Naomi uh, Pra Kada International Yiddish Summer Program at Tel Aviv University in 2019. And she also is a regularly consults various international regional organizations. And last but not least, we also have um, um, Dr. Olga Ornuch. Olga, please correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the right pronunciation? Um, Olga Ornuch. 
yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Uh, Olga Onok, so my apologies. Olga is an associate professor in politics at the University of Manchester, which she joined in 2014 after holding posts at the University of Toronto, University of Oxford and Harvard University. Um, she uh, is also an associate uh, of Nafield College um, at Oxford and the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Olga was also a research fellow at the Davis Center in Harvard in 2017. Uh, Olga is amazingly research active, focusing on comparative study of protests, uh, including uh, elections, migration and identity in Eastern Europe and now Latin America. And um, Olga is also a regular media commentator for um, international broadcasters. So um, today we will focus on uh, uh, March 25th, which is the Freedom Day, Den Boli, uh, for, for Belarusians, um, which obviously has a very, very long history going back to this, uh, 1918. And it is a very special day for all democratic forces uh, or democratically minded Belarusians for that um, um, matter. A day to celebrate independence, which was declared, declared by, Belarusian, um, by Belarus Democratic Republic in 1918. Um, but of course, in contrast for um, Alexander Lukashenko, this day has always been um, problematic. I think the quote uh, somewhere, uh, was that he said that it's a, it was a dismal day in Belarusian history. Well, of course, there are several, several reasons uh, for him to say so. One of them, of course, that during this day normally, many Belarusians would normally um, take it to the streets uh, to, to march and protest uh, against um, the, um, the regime. Uh, but also, uh, of course, it has a very special memory in, um, uh, for Belarusians um, uh, in, it, uh, in itself. This year, it also has a very even more significant meaning in the context of occupation of Belarus by Russia's military force and um, also the, the, the war in Ukraine. So there are a lot of questions, of course, that um, uh, we will ask today. Uh, related perhaps, uh, first of all, to the collective memory that this day holds for many Belarusians, but also for Belarusian identity and how it all is changing in the context of the war in Ukraine and also Russia's presence on Belarus territory. So all these questions um, uh, we will um, address today, but perhaps, first of all, uh, I'll give the floor to um, um, David Marples, uh, be because unfortunately David has to escape to give another lecture somewhere else. Uh, but David, please um, give us your opinion basically on why it is important and what we should um, really uh, consider when we think about the future in the current circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's nice to join this group again. And. Um, I was just going to say that uh, just, just as, as we started, I got a phone call from my daughter's school saying she'd had a fall, but apparently she's okay. So um, that's why I was looking a little bit concerned uh, when we first started. Um, I wanted to say that um, March the 25th, uh, Freedom Day, uh, is a key event in, in the Belarusian past. And it's been an identity marker that has sort of delineated let's say, national Belarus from the sort of Belarus that Lukashenko has tried to conceive, which of course is one with uh, Lukashenko himself at the hierarchy, but one that's very much focused on the Second World War and really limited to the Second World War as a marker of Belarusian identity. The fact that this state was so short-lived, about um, six months or so, and then a little bit longer uh, in Lithuania, uh, means that there was no real time to establish the foundations of a, of a longer term state. And in fact, in many ways, I think the uh, National Republic and the Belarusian SSR that followed, although it went through several stages, have sometimes been linked together. In other words, that the fact that there was a state founded in March the 25th, 1918, was uh, one reason for the establishment of a Belarusian Republic by Lenin's government in Moscow. And in the 1920s, you can see as well that there were some foundations built for a genuine Belarusian 
national state with the development of culture and the development of language on an unprecedented scale. Uh, perhaps this is the key period of cultural building, I would say, of the Belarusian state, albeit under communist control. And despite the fact that once Stalin came into full power, he completely obliterated everything and destroyed the Belarusian national elite um, through the 1930s, but particularly in 1937, 38, when he focused on the, the literary figures and execution of about 100 writers, which again is another date um, commemorated in Belarus today. And I was thinking about um, the period of uh, Sikhanovskaya's campaign and how this was carried out in Belarus, because this may be a sign of how genuine Belarusians can celebrate their state and what they would really like to acknowledge. And this was a generally um, benign, peaceful demonstration um, all the way through. And in terms of markers, eventually we see that the white, red, white flag becomes a marker, but it wasn't initially, it wasn't during the general campaign. And at times during the protests, we did see analogies made with the, with the partisans during the war. And in terms of the, the riot police, the security forces, comparisons were made directly with the German occupation forces. It's going to be hard, I think, in the future for Belarusians to completely eradicate the Second World War. But I think what also needs to be considered in identifying key events in the past, besides March 25, besides the Second World War, I would name two others. One is the Stalinist period in Belarus, which was exceptionally destructive. And I would think that the, the Kurapati memorial site must become a marker of national identity, it must become a symbol in the same way that the Holodomor Museum became in Ukraine and the Holodomor itself became a defining part of who Ukrainians are and defining in that sense and the other as well. I think that has to be the case. The suffering endured during those years is really why someone like Lukashenko could come to power. And despite his attacks on Belarusian identity, somehow, at least until 2020, had a, a, a significant amount of support from, from some of the local population. The second thing, I think, is the Holocaust in Belarus. This was a, another event that simply wiped out part of Belarusian society. And more or less forever, there was something like 13,000 Jews living in Belarus last time I looked. The Holocaust removed about 600,000. So in terms of Stalinism and looking at that impact and the massacres that took place at Kuropati and every other city in Soviet Belarus at that time, I would add, at the Holocaust as well. And I would say finally that I think much will depend on writing. I mean, it depends on scholars. Scholars have to denote these events. They have to write books. The books have to get into the school system. The school system has to include them as priorities. And I would say primarily in Belarusian language, but for the time being in Russian as well to reach the wider audience. And it will take some time. And all everything that I've said today, of course, is a very optimistic outlook, hoping that this terrible war that's been inflicted on Ukraine doesn't spread further and that Belarusians are not co-opted into sending their troops into Ukraine as well, as, be, as has been the case so far. Uh, I think it looks increasingly unlikely that we will see an end to this war anytime soon. So I'm prognosticating the future, let's say 10, 20 years down the road, um, it's, it's hard to see. But I think Belarusians have shown over the past few years that they want change and that they want to build their own national state and that Vladimir Putin and his cronies uh, should not be part of it. So I'll stop at that, um, Elena, and uh, hope I've thrown out enough there for discussion. Absolutely. Thank you very much, um, David, and thank you for giving us uh, uh, this kind of um, history perspective, because it's important to understand why this particular day is so relevant for, for Belarusians, but also looking forward uh, to see what Belarusians need to reconcile with 
in order to move forward uh, and put their past not so much behind, but actually kind of in trying to construct their identity to look forward to the future. Um, I'll move on then to Alexander, um, because, hi, uh, Alexander, because I think it would be very important uh, kind of looking forward uh, to understand what kind of day Belarusians want to see uh, as a freedom day, uh, but especially, you know, put it in the context of today, what is happening in Belarus, how many people are uh, fleeing, being persecuted, uh, but also in the context of war um, in Ukraine. So Alexander, please, the floor is yours. And David, thank you very much. I understand you need to run. So if you need to go, please go. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good, good to see you all. Good to be with you again. Uh, can you hear me well? All good? Yes. Wonderful. You. So um, I, I'll probably start by uh, reflecting already on what Professor Markles has said. I think it will be useful to kick off the discussion and not to just present my views, but to already start reacting to some of the points made. I cannot but agree was one of the most fundamental points that uh, Professor Marples made that this uh, this date marks the adoption of a document of the of a political move that has solidified the aspiration of the Belarusian nation to build the national state. And I think that this is exactly what uh, we need to bear in mind when we're looking at it. Uh, in the past and when we're looking at what it will be turning into uh, in the future as well. I think the key point here and the key word here is exactly the nation state. And I think that um, um, I'm by far uh, the least academic representative here, but uh, uh, judging by what I have been studying in my past academic uh, endeavors, I do have a sense that the whole concept of a nation state is slowly being replaced by something that we, that I might term probably incorrectly as a constitution based state where the adherence to the common set of laws and rules and the regulations replaces the identity based on ethnic, cultural or uh, territorial um, parameters. And if you're looking at the document adopted uh, 100 and uh, four years ago on the 25th of March, the third uh, charter, I would say, uh, of the Belarusian Popular Republic. This one is clearly about the ethnic, cultural, geographic uh, uh, criteria for the announcement of the independent proclamation of the independence of the nation. In this regard, I am much more um, drawn to the second charter, which has been adopted on the 9th of March, and uh, which is much more targeted much more related to the proclamation of the fundamental rights and freedoms that are to be enjoyed in the Belarusian pop, pop, popular republic. Uh, the uh, point, uh, let me take a look. Uh, there are eight points there that are all about the uh, what we term now economic, social, uh, cultural and political and civil rights. And I think that this is uh, something that in my opinion is a much more um, forward-looking uh, document rather than the proclamation of the 25th of March, which is talking about establishing the new country in the, in the uh, territories where the Belarusians de facto reside. I think that this is something that is uh, Looking at it from the from the perspective of the 21st century, I can completely understand why the uh, significance of that was so high 104 years ago. But looking at it now, I think I, I am finding a lot more inspiration in the second charter of the 9th of March. And uh, that I am saying also from my perspective of a person who is dealing with civil and political rights much more than with any other sets of rights. Uh, but looking ahead, I think that we're also, we also uh, have to recognize that the significance of the events of 1918 for the establishment and the proclamation of the independence of our country is uh, slightly different than how it is treated in the historiography and the historical memory of the our neighbors in the Baltic states, for example. I think the uh, situation here is... Uh, in Belarus is quite different in terms of uh, uh, the Baltic states, for example, having been able to establish a functional state in between the 1918 and the 1940, and then uh, retrieving and reclaiming their independence in 1990, uh, and and 
not just portraying that as the reclaiming of the independence, but actually restoring something that has already been in place. As Professor Marbles has already mentioned, I think that our forefathers, uh, there were no foremothers involved in that from what I know, uh, formally speaking at least, uh, but these gentlemen, they haven't had the time to establish a functioning, uh, um, functioning state. Um, so I think uh, we're also haven't really reclaimed the independence in the early 90s. And at this moment in time, looking ahead, when we will be building the new functioning democratic state in Belarus, we will probably going to be building it as much against the backdrop of uh, the times of Lukashenko as uh, against the backdrop of the longer history, be it the Soviet or the pre-Soviet history of Belarus. So in this regard, I think it is extremely important for us to not um, get fully fixated on the uh, cultural, ethnic, uh, uh, geographic definition of what is it uh, what is the state that we are aspiring to build or rebuild, but rather focus a bit more on the civil, political, economic, social rights that are uh, that have been reflected in another uh, document of the Belarusian People's Republic. I don't want to diminish the value of the 25th of March. I think it has become a symbolic holiday, but I do call on the uh, attendees to pay attention, not just to the document that we're celebrating tomorrow, but to the, uh, to the other proclamations and declarations of the Belarusian public, uh, Popular Republic as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alexander, uh, um, for your also thought-provoking um, uh, comments, uh, because yet again, in light of kind of historical memory, they're very important. So what, what exactly we're celebrating on the 25th of March? And you're right that um, talking about nation state today is a little bit problematic uh, uh, also for the reasons that what actually 2020 prot protests came to symbolize. It's less about kind of nationhood per se, but perhaps more about bringing people together. It's more about peoplehood. And I think indeed, you're right, it's the mobilization of, of that kind of civil protest that took place in Belarus. But at the same time, we should not really diminish the role uh, of collective memory. And we need to recall that memory from the past, including, uh, of course, going back to 19. 18, and it's very good that you gave us some kind of uh, introduction to um, uh, Charter 3, but also uh, uh, that um, took place on the 25th of March, but also going kind of even earlier, a version uh, that took place on the 9th of March, which is also very important. And with that in mind, of course, we know that the future of Belarus will be built on that. Uh, with reference, including, of course, with reference to the recent events and Lukashenko regime, of course. But let me turn perhaps now to Veronika. Veronika is um, uh, specializing uh, research in collective memory uh, and the trauma of the um, Second, um, collect, uh, Second World War um, in how it actually all this shaped the Belarusian identity uh, and also what has gone amiss in terms of, uh, uh, you know, bringing all that identity together. So Veronika, please, the floor is yours. It would be interesting to take your, your view on um, what matters and why we have, um, unlike, for example, the Ukrainians or uh, the Baltic states, why we haven't really managed to, uh, um, kind of grab the opportunity and run with it as a nation state in Belarus. Uh, Helena, thank you very much for this discussion. I think it's wonderful that we are discussing exact, especially this topic, topic of collective memory uh, related to this day, the day of our freedom, because I think this is something which we still, all of us as a nation, we have to reflect. And um, Following what my uh, dear colleagues have mentioned, uh, Professor Dave Marples and also Alexander, uh, I want actually to challenge a little bit what has been said. Um, you were saying also, Elena, that um, I'm doing PhD and it will be my little coming out that I was supposed to defend my PhD long ago, but I'm super happy I didn't because last year, uh, not last year, but 2020, show to us, demonstrated to all of us that what we were thinking about 
how Belarusians see each other in this um, uh, system of coordinates in terms of where they are as a nation, as people, it's completely different from what it was said even by independent sociologists. Belarusians demonstrate that they needed this uh, connection with their, their flag, with their symbols, with uh, their historical narrative, with their language as well. And um, what Alexander is saying about the identity that it should be based on constitution and civil rights, absolutely true. But I personally don't believe that it can happen in a country like Belarus without this phase of uh, proper self-reflection and also reconciliation on who they are as a nation, as, a, as peoples, what are their common history um, and what it should lead to. And um, I think this is one of the reasons, this lack of self-reflection so far and this lack of knowledge of uh, very hard, very difficult um, periods of Belarusian history uh, prevent Belarusians in many ways from going further, even in their democratic uh, developments. Uh, Belarus, unlike Baltic states and Ukraine, is the only country where uh, archives, uh, have never been open. Uh, so the country, which was extremely traumatized, not only by the uh, by their uh, NKVD or KGB repressions during Stalinist time and later on, but also for the Second World War, um, never really um, contemplated what was happening. Uh, at the moment, I'm working at the Holocaust Museum uh, in Washington, and I'm looking into original documents, which they were able to take from our archives in 1993, 1995. Then, because of the nature of our regime, uh, this became problematic. And uh, I can see that, unfortunately, we wanted or we don't, there were many instances of anti-Semitism in Belarus. There were many instances of collaborationism with the Nazis. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the population of Belarus was extremely traumatized but be, by behaving not only the Nazis, but also by Soviet partisans. And what was happening on the Belarusian territory during the war, uh, and although there were uh, still people alive who initially had been part of 1918 uh, Belarusian People's Republic and this movement, um, it was very hard for them to find themselves in this um, ex extremely cumbersome situation where there were uh, Polish army at Krajowa, where there were also uh, Ukrainian uh, independent army in the south, where there were Nazi Soviet partisans, where there was uh, a Belarusian national movement. And uh, the Belarusian population found themselves in an extremely difficult situation. Uh, plus, because it was uh, the territory where partisans were extremely active, and this, uh, of course, led to many instances of terrific, terrifying revenge uh, coming from the Nazis. Uh, this notion of what it is to be a nation, is it okay to speak Belarusian? Is it okay to, uh, to name ourselves Belarusians? Um, they never fully understood this. And also, uh, the very fact that a lot of... Um, uh, majority of Belarusian uh, Jews, of course, were also liquidated during the Second World War. Many of them uh, were playing an extremely important part in also state building and national building of Belarus, as we know. Uh, it also played a very uh, diminishing role in, in, in understanding of Belarusians what it was, what this element was. Uh, the problem are uh, Belarus had after the independence 1991 is that unlike again Baltic states of Ukraine, it, there has never been any interest from this from the uh, perspective of the state of the Belarusian state to really dig in into this um, uh, contesting memories and experience to see what it brought, what it should lead to, how to live with this, and. Uh, as we see, it is still extremely, extremely painful for the Belarusian regime somehow to uh, get back to this uh, important question. Uh, they prefer indeed to just inherit and to use the legacy of the Soviet narrative of the glorifying uh, Second World War past of uh, Belarus as a neo-Soviet uh, uh, state uh, in many ways, even in the economy, right? 
And uh, for this reason, we also see that uh, such places, Mala Trasinias, which I or, or kind of specifically work on now, Kurapati, which I also work on now, these are kind of big topics which we started together with David Marcos, who is not here now in, back in 2017, but because of the changes in, in Belarus, we kind of are doing this project now in a different way. But um, this, um, this place, this venue is extremely um, uh, painful for the regime and they're, they're very cautious about this. And also they get irritated very easily when something is happening about these uh, places. We know how the regime is treating Kurapati. We know that Smitar Dashkevich, who has been a uh, defendant Kurapati, was just detained yesterday. Another person, Pavel Severin, is from the Belarusian Christian Democracy, who have who has been also for years defending Kurapati from any illegal construction and so on, um, is in jail and is going to spend there um, five and a half more years. So this shows that uh, Belarusian regime still tries to uh, suppress any initiatives on this level. But I think they're absolutely important. They're absolutely um, uh, inevitable for us as a nation, as people, to think about, to contemplate, to to do proper historical work, to do proper uh, social work as a society. Um, otherwise, we won't be able to get to the place where we are. And also, um, the element of war in Ukraine, of course, specifically shows uh, that uh, in this way, we're not understood by our neighbors. So our neighbors, I think, they, thought, they think that we have done this work, but we haven't. And they think that we might uh, also treat war in a different way. Uh, I was given an interview uh, an, um, uh, uh, a week ago to uh, the Czech journalist, and he was saying that uh, I know that in Czech Republic, some Belarusians were ostracized and were kind of um, uh, were not treated fairly. And that's because uh, they don't understand that war for Belarusians is such a, a terrifying trauma, which has never been, you know, worked through as if it should be worked, you know, on a global level with a psychologist, I would say that Belarusians would never support any kind of war, especially uh, in neighboring countries, because in the almost genetic memory is still, uh, is still there. Uh, we still have uh, grandparents who remember uh, the war. We know this from our chat, how they were telling us, our parents. So our, our old generations, we still are very much embedded into this. And also speaking about uh, um, how uh, Belarusians see the war in Ukraine. I can only uh, cite my friend who is means could get a survivor who is 84 at the moment, who said on the 2nd of March that uh, this was the day of a big pogrom in Minsk Geta, um, 60th, uh, sorry, 80th anniversary. And uh, um, he was saying that just the day before um, we know that Russian troops, they were bombing Babi Yar, and for them, for people who survived the Holocaust in Belarus, it, it, it hurt as much as if bombs were hitting our pit memorial, Malitrasinets concentration camp, all these places which were, uh, which became places of uh, final solution of mass destruction in Belarus. So this is how we treat this war. But once again, I want to stress the fact that we need to work on it. We need to reflect on that. We need public discussion. We need discussion within the historians. We need discussion within political scientists. We need to, um, we should not um, undermine this important issue, how to treat this uh, in order to celebrate our Freedom Day properly with full knowledge of what it is for us, what it means for us, and what it should bring us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, you shared a very important um, perspective on how we actually should understand who we are and what we are and where we came from. And of course, this sense of what we are cannot really occur without, uh, you know, without the full knowledge of what occurred in the past. And that knowledge clearly comes with uh, you know, writing, but also discussing and so on. And I I indeed, there are so many dark um, spots in our history um, that we need to learn about in order to kind of reconcile this, um, well, this memory in order then to move forward with, in, in our understanding uh, 
where, where, where to go and what we want to achieve as a nation. So your work and your work with David Marples as well are absolutely um, essential um, in that matter, but I'm sure we'll continue that um, discussion in a moment. Let me turn to Ukraine. I know that Olga, uh, she's well, being Ukrainian herself, but also having a lot of uh, connections and research uh, focus on Ukraine. Um, um, I think it would be important to um, cross-reference uh, uh, in terms of this kind of collective memories, what allowed Ukraine, uh, you know, to really kind of spread out as a nation, which that's what we see today, you know, the kind of glory to Ukraine, which really symbolizes that kind of move forward. Um, but also, you, Ukraine also had some painful memories, which at the moment, I know that Russia, for example, Russian propaganda exploits uh, a, um, a, a, um, in its mobilization against um, or disinformation uh, 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 against Ukraine. So Olga, could you please give us perhaps your perspective on um, what helped Ukraine to push forward, but also in, to, in terms of nation, nation building, uh, but also in the context of the current war, do you think Belarusians and Ukrainians, the future generation, will they be able to reconcile these kind of difficult moments of history where when, the, when the Lukashenko made that decision to allow Russian troops to move freely in their attack of Ukraine? Well, you've asked me a lot of things there. So I'm, I'm going to pick and choose. Pick and, choose I, please, yes. <laughs> and I'm going to do three things in my brief comments. Um, one is in part to reply to already some of the points that were made. Um, very briefly reflect on the Ukrainian, actually, uh, memory and identity context. And then I'd like to actually turn to some of the data that we collected over 2020 about Belarusian protesters. And I'm a very empirical, sciencey kind of person. So I'd like to just explore some of the things that we learned there and to make some propositions in relation to this discussion. So 20, uh, so 1918 is, you know, uh, this, this symbol and this day that you, it's celebratory, but also protests. There's already a, a long history of events around the day that mean different things to different people, as you've already identified. It almost sounds, if you are not a uh, Belarusian yourself, or if you're not uh, an expert of Belarusian politics, that there is this, over the 90s, over the 2000s and onwards, and today, there's these parallel states of identity, right? And these different symbols pull and push these different parallel identity states. And I thought it was interesting that, uh, Alexander, that you said nation state versus constitutional state. Well, I think it can be one and the same and those things can mean very different things to different people and yet they can find unity in it. Why do I say that? And I think we'd actually, I wouldn't encourage necessarily self-reflection as uh, uh, Veronica, as you, you mentioned, because it's exactly the sort of things that people were talking about in Ukraine for a long period of time. Academics in the nineties, most of those who were foreigners, um, but not only said, we need to t reflect on what our identity is. How much is it civic and how much is it ethnic? How much is it linguistic? How much, which symbols are the most important to us? These tended to be academic level discussions. Um, and sometimes they were right, sometimes they were wrong. <laughs> it, what we did see time and time again, whether it was at mass mobilizations or at elections uh, or in other uh, situations currently that you're seeing ordinary citizens protest against occupation, use their bare hands to stop tanks and so on. At the ordinary citizen level, these things weren't as important in the same way that they were to us in our, in our academic discussions. And I think it's, or activist discussions, those of us who in Ukraine were activists in the 2004 protests or else uh, at different points in time. So we really need to be careful about uh, creating false dichotomies of identity, civic versus nation in some sense, and also trying to pin identity to periods of victimhood, 
to periods of difficulty in historical past. I disagree actually with David. Holodomor has not been a very good unifying uh, rooting symbol of identity in Ukraine because it had a contested understanding for so long in Ukraine. There were other things about Ukrainian statehood around dissidents uh, from the 60s and 70s that were actually Russian speakers or ethnically Russian and Jewish, but said and did things to support the Ukrainian civic identity, right? So I think there's other historical moments that ordinary citizens will end up telling academic uh, Belarusians uh, what their key focal points are and symbols. And so one of the things here, when my own student did, um, PhD student who has now uh, completed her PhD, Anna Glue, did an extensive study on um, ordinary citizens engagement in collective memory uh, since the Evromaidan and during the first eight years of war, she said they naturally turned to ideas of civic nationhood um, rather than some of the things that the National Institute of History would like the Ukrainians to focus on in building their statehood or nationhood, right? Um, and that was repeated time and time again. And I, I, I don't know that much about the Belarusian population, but I do know what I do know from the surveys we conducted. And here I'd just like to briefly show you some things. Um, very, very quickly, I won't be going into details here. Um, I wanna show you just this. So we conducted over, I don't, some people might know this, um, some people might not. We conducted a survey starting um, uh, the 18th of August, 2020 um, online. And we ran that survey well into January the following year. Um, it was an online social media generated sample. Uh, we oversampled men and youth because those are the populations that are not typically uh, uh, best captured by social media generated surveys. We ended up, uh, our overall sample was 41,000 respondents. So our survey is one of the largest corpuses of any survey on Belarusians ever, <laughs> right? Uh, aside from census data. So it's a very unique, problematic in all sorts of ways, but a unique data set. And we captured protest participants. That was our goal to capture protest participants, but also captured non protest participants because we needed to compare and contrast these two different populations and try to understand the protesters better. So I'd like you just to pay attention to this. 93% um, filled out the survey in, in, in Russian and 6% filled out the survey in Belarusian, okay? Somebody out there might make a very big statement about what all those things mean. I study very similar things in Ukraine, so I would never make a statement that that sells us anything at all. In fact, that is um, language practice, language comfort, all sorts of things might be at play. And they were, they were able to choose the language and switch the language if they wanted to. If you look at the descriptive statistics of, of, of our survey, and we asked about mother tongue, the language you use at work, the language used in private life, your ethnic belonging, but also your civic belonging, which is not listed here, your nationality. And we found that it was a very much more diverse group than that 96% Russian. So uh, mother tongue, actually about, you know, 44% said that, that Russian was their mother tongue and 35% said Belarusian. Now, so if we only took the language of the completion of the survey, we would have a very false idea uh, of identity um, markers amongst the Belarusians we surveyed. Because what people are telling us in their mother tongue, they didn't feel comfortable enough to conduct the survey in Belarusian, right? But they are telling us something about their identity there. Similarly, when we ask about um, ethnicity, it's a, uh, everyone, well, not everyone, but 76% saw themselves to be Belarusian. When we ask nationality, there's even a higher number that see themselves as Belarusian. And this is what we consider civic identity. So what is interesting is that these markers weren't that different across protesters and non-protesters. So in fact, we can build a story about people trying to signal some kind of nationhood or ethnic or linguistic identity uh, on 
both sides of, of, of the protest non protest group. When we conduct statistical analyses to see if these things are statistically significant, right? So language practice, nationality, ethnic group belonging, uh, the language one chooses for one survey, we find some statistical significance in that protesters were much more likely to tell us that they belonged uh, to, the, to the Belarusian nation. They were also more likely uh, to be those of 6% who chose the survey in, in um, Belarusian. And they were also more likely to tell us that they had a native language that was Belarusian. These were identification things. They shouldn't be understood as ethnicity in a primordial sense, right? These are very much civic identity things. I'll skip this. Interestingly though, there was a lot of discussion in throughout the protests that the protests themselves were a way to, were a, some Belarusian scholar said it was a Belar uh, an uh, identity awakening in Belarus that taking place. And if that was the case, we would expect late joiners of the protests in uh, those not in August, um, those in maybe September or October or November, to be more likely to then to tell us that they are Belarusian speakers or that they are Belarusian in a different identity um, uh, uh, factor. And that's not the case. In fact, having declared that your native language is Belarusian was only significant for the early risers in the very first week of protest. For all the other groups across time, if you joined between August and uh, January, you were not any more likely to have any of these particular linguistic or ethnic identities at display. Um, uh, the split frequency, those who were very frequent protesters were actually the only ones that were more likely to have a specific Belarusian native language identity. But those who regularly, but not all, not, you know, more than 11 times protest, there was no difference. What were collective identity markers that were most important in our, in our project's view? We've identified two other things. Democrats, people with a strong sense of civic duty, um, preferring the democratic system over all else, uh, believing that citizens have a, a duty to engage in elections, a duty to protest. That was much more important in driving protest engagement than any of those ethno-linguistic um, identity markers. So it builds that idea that there's a civic identity already quite strongly present amongst these individuals. Um, and lastly, what we found in a paper we recently published is that those civic identity markers, those uh, national state identity markers and a pro-European identity all match up and map onto each other. So what, I would suggest this data is telling us is actually not so different from what we saw in Ukraine uh, for so very many years. The things that Ukrainian citizens were telling us as well, that we are Democrats, that we are Europeans, that we value civic duty and democracy, and that the rest, well, sometimes we feel more comfortable speaking in Belarusian Sometimes we want to signal that we speak in a different language, but those are not the most important things to us and what unifies us in this state building or nation building um, process. So I was really pleased to see that in my research because I think that suggests that there's, that some of the strength that we are seem to be, some people seem to be so surprised by Ukrainians in the streets, um, the civic identity that, goes across east to south and language one speaks and ethnic background is actually present in Belarus as well. Um, and I'm not so sure we need to go back in history to help strengthen it. It's there. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Olga. And especially thank you for showing us um, the kind of the general picture 
um, and what could potentially matter as a tools for as tools for rebuilding or building uh, Belarusian identity in in the future. Okay, so uh, we've now come um, to the part where we can um, kind of open up the floor to kind of asking questions to each other because I think what is important here is um, really to kind of try and differentiate what matters, you know, those kind of instruments, tools and so on, what matters the most for um, for, for the identity building, especially in the context of our times, when everything is so fluid, uh, uh, everyone is so mobile, everything is so complex, but also the war um, in Ukraine, that kind of um, tearing us apart in many different ways. So I wonder, of course, Olga's intervention was very helpful in the sense uh, that, uh, especially in the sense that we should not try and stick to all these sometimes indeed very false dichotomies of what we are trying to understand what we are in terms of be it either ethnic or be it by belonging or be it through uh, really civic or political activism. So the question to you all, if we are to build, uh, let's say we're trying to construct, rebuild that identity or reinforce, facilitate that identity of, uh, forward uh, for the Belarusians. What do we really need to pay attention to? Uh, and it's a big question. One of my colleagues who works with the Arab Spring, um, he suggested that it, it is actually very much a combination of intergenerational knowledge, which as Veronika pointed out, actually often is a miss mm -hmm. uh, in people for whatever reasons. But it is intergenerational knowledge that speaks also to the future, the imageries of the future. And that's where, of course, the kind of national symbols become very important. It's what we want to be. But for that idea as to what we want to be, I think we need to go through that kind of reflective process of what we are and what where we want to be as, as, as a nation. So, uh, and that's where perhaps also constitutional um, identity also matters. So let's talk about the tools. What can help us to kind of to move, move forward, uh, facilitate, kind of ignite um, the, the process of identity building, especially now in the context of everything fragmenting, uh, you know, tearing the ties that we had before. How do we move forward with that? Anyone would like to take the lead? Um, Veronica, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can do. I would like to thank Olga for this fantastic uh, data. And I think uh, that this is uh, what you showed is actually something Belarusians are fully aware of. So mm -hmm. we all know that uh, how we think about us is ourselves is not language. It's not the language we speak with, I don't know, the family, friends, it's something different. And I think, um, uh, this I will uh, connect this with your question, Elena, that um, when we speak about identity and who we are, it's the com uh, it's the all these components uh, which unite together. Because when Belarusians were protesting in 2020, they were not protesting for their language. They were not protesting for uh, their history. They were protesting for their state, which they wanted to be democratic and free, as you said, but also they were clearly showing that they associate themselves with their state um, whose symbols are not neo-Soviet symbols propagated by their regime, but something different. So in this way, and they were also kind of connected themselves with the history and showing that uh, this is also important to them. And this is how they want to continue to exist and to live to use uh, the Belarusian People's Republic and this kind of uh, alternative narrative, which is negated by the regime as uh, something they get attached to. And also, um, I want to address also Olga's point about self-reflection. I think that um, you, uh, what you're saying that it's not very needed because when you look into Ukrainians and their identity, it's about, of course, civil duty and democracy, democratic values, and Belarusians have something similar. Yes, 
But this only shows that Belarusians, uh, in my opinion, um, are perhaps uh, very just European uh, in, inside them overall uh, for many reasons. And because also it's a compact country, it's a small country, it's a more homogeneous country. Um, and that is why they already are at this kind of stage as Ukrainians are. But I still think, I still believe that uh, um, this kind of historical reflection, this open discussion of what was uh, happened during the Second World War, what was happening during anti-Soviet resistance, what was happening uh, in the interwar period is very much needed in Belarus. In Ukraine, you had 20 years to talk about this. In Belarus, we had four between 1999 and 1995. Uh, so uh, I still think that if this was present, perhaps um, our protests in 2020 would have gone in a different way, but also perhaps our political elites would have behaved in a different way, would have been probably more uh, confident in themselves and what they should go through, what they should lead to. Um, so I think that uh, here we can speak indeed about a combination of a lot of components, which are important, and which both Alexander and Olga and David and myself have said. Uh, but I would insist uh, still on this uh, extreme necessity of public discussion, which unfortunately can only happen on a high scale if, uh, of course, our archives will be open, which have never been the case in Belarus, unfortunately. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Veronica. Um, Alexander, you would like to, to respond? Uh, oh, <clears throat> not, not so much to respond, but to maybe just carry, carry on the, the, uh, okay. the message that the, uh, Veronica has been putting forward now. But first, uh, thank you very much to Olga for presenting the figures. I think it's uh, quite illustrative, very interesting. Uh, reflects very well what is the findings of the national survey regarding, regarding the language. Uh, very very few people say they use Belarusian on, on a daily basis or at home, but uh, tremendous numbers are shown of people saying it's their mother tongue. So I think it's, uh, it's the, you're right, Olga, this is, a, this is a sign of a civic identity rather than anything that is ethnic or linguistic or, or anything else. Um, but I do, I, do, I do know that there is a difference between Ukraine and Belarus in terms of the use of languages in the everyday life. Uh, it suffices to come to uh, Kiev, which I can't wait to do again, to hear the difference between Minsk and Kiev in terms of uh, language use. Uh, and I'm just speaking capital, yeah? And uh, Ukraine is a, a more diverse country in this sense as well. And I, I do recall one of some of the first statements of President Zelensky when he just got elected, when he was saying that, what do you want from me? I've only started using Ukrainian in the second grade when I was being taught the language. So, you know, don't, don't expect much from me, but I am taking classes. And now using U Ukrainian only is uh, one of the trademarks of uh, President Zelensky as well. Um, and kudos to him. Uh, I think he's made a great progress in this regard in, uh, in the years that he has been serving as the president. But uh, one thing that I would want to mention, and that's addressing uh, your question, Elena, that uh, what, what will be important carrying forward? And I think uh, here, Belarusian uh, pro-democracy folks have made their fundamental choice. They, I think, have uh, um, moved, we have moved away from this false dichotomy of uh, choosing, the, of uh, fighting for democracy without talking geopolitics. And uh, I think now it is pretty clear that uh, the pro-democracy forces in Belarus are on the side of Ukraine, but not because we are on the side of Ukraine as such, but because we understand very well that it is a non-democracy, it is a dictatorship attacking a democracy. And we are being pro-democracy, we are on the side of the, the, the democratic state of Ukraine. But what I want to pose, and again, maybe trying to be a bit more uh, provocative here. I do have a sense that um, we will have a lot of work to do between Belarus and Ukraine in the future to actually make sure that we know something about each other. Uh, it is my impression uh, that, uh, that I have developed over the last uh, several weeks. Uh, I had this suspicion before, uh, having worked in Ukraine in the context of elections uh, and having discussions with multiple very well-educated and very well-versed uh, in current affairs people. But uh, I did have that impression, but now I, it's pretty much a conviction of mine that we know very little of, of each other. 
I have the sense that people, common people in Belarus have very little knowledge about the Ukrainian politics, uh, model of governance, development over the last uh, years, the internal debates, issues and differences within Ukraine. And uh, that makes them quite susceptible to the propaganda that they are consuming, uh, where the messages are simple, direct and false, as opposed to complex, multifaceted and uh, true. Uh, and I conversely, I do have a sense, a strong sense, that Ukrainians know extremely little about Belarus of 2020 and after the 2020. I think, uh, and it will be no secret to you, I think every uh, observer of politics in the region has noticed that uh, Ukraine has been purchasing the oil products from Belarus until the 23rd of February in the evening, and then continued the deliveries even after the Russian invasion started. President Zelensky has avoided every opportunity to meet uh, Madame Tikhanovska over the last year and a half. And I can understand his calculation. He has been calculating probably that uh, he doesn't want to uh, provoke Lukashenko into you know, becoming an enemy. Well, how well did that work out? Um, I not, you know, I'm just trying to be very cool headed here, but I do have a sense that the Ukrainian people have very little understanding of the issues that Belarus has been going through and the pro-democracy forces and the pro-democracy people in Belarus have been going through uh, since 2020. So I think that there will be a lot of work to do to not only stand on the same side of history, yeah? not to just build this important moral bond of we are on the side of democracy, but to actually do something practical about it so that we can actually live in the common information realm and try to understand each other and the lives of the two countries a bit better if we are to make this bond uh, lasting. Um, otherwise, I think uh, there is a bit of an issue here of um, being together pro-democracy in the time of crisis and then sailing our own ways once the crisis hopefully ends. So I think uh, there is a lesson for the two countries and for the people, democratically minded people that maybe this civic uh, uh, or constitutional identity or civic identity that can be crossing borders. Uh, and that's maybe the reaffirmation that, you know, the whole concept of a nation state might be going a little bit uh, into a recession and we can erase this border because we are on the, on the same side of history. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, for this reflection. Olga, would you like to... Thank yes, you. there's a lot to pick up on. First of all, I fundamentally disagree that Ukraine is more diverse than Belarus in this sense. I study language practice and ethnicity, and I, I you don't know this, but I studied also, I studied the gene revolution, and I've studied activists in Belarus for many, many years. I just didn't publish them in my book. So I've actually been studying Belarus for an extremely long time. And I don't think there is that much difference when it comes to a lot of these things when we're studying it. Uh, I think it's very odd to say that Ukraine is more diverse if we're looking at the same markers between Belarus and Ukraine. In fact, Ukraine might be even less diverse in some sense, looking at the same um, markers. But I was speaking, also, I'm sorry, I think, Olga, I was speaking about ethnicity. You have a lot of ethnic groups. We don't. Literally, I mean ethnicity. In, in terms of ethnic terms, Ukraine is less diverse than Belarus, um, statistically speaking. So, But we can go into details about that. This is not with the part of the conversation. I just think that this underlies some of the misunderstandings. And specifically, I think it's very worthwhile, two things that I want to, I just want to reply to, because just like Belarusians were frustrated, and rightfully so, with people starting to study Belarus without having studied it before in 2020 and saying all sorts of obnoxious things about Belarusians, which I found infuriating um, uh, as well. But I think it's very important for Belarusians also when they're speaking about Ukraine to have that same respect and and and. So I actually think that Belarus has been extremely well covered in the Ukrainian press and media over the last two years. In fact, when we look at um, when we look at our social media data and mobilize, and we look for where the largest numbers of retweeting and support about Belarusian protests, they were actually not coming from Poland or Lithuania. They were coming from Ukraine. So this was top of the news agenda for for Ukrainians, and. What politicians made decisions, I'm not going to talk about the, the I, 
I, I can't even defend it. So Alexander, I'm not going to talk about Zelensky's decisions. But I think that's maybe Belarusians didn't understand how very much Ukrainians were involved in and very much empathetically living through what was happening in Belarus. And there's also, we have survey data of the Ukrainian population and their views about Belarusians and protests over the last two years. If I, if I knew that this is where the discussion was gonna go, I, I would have it on hand. I think it would surprise you quite frankly, Alexander. Um, but what I do wanna say is that Ukrainians heard Belarusians talk about, when they were talking about their protests and identity around the protest, they actually wanted to identify themselves as not Ukrainians because Ukrainians were nationalists and these things that led to war later. That was all misinformation and propaganda. There was very few nationalists involved in the Euromaidan, less than, you know, we're talking about single digits, less than 4% of all the 2 million that participated. But so, there might have been dis dis uh, misunderstandings and disagreements. Um, but I think it's important that we have these discussions and we look at the data actually to back up what we are saying. Elena, to, to um, mm -hmm. respond to your original question, how do we build identity? This is, I think, what national, national focused, not nationalist, but nation focused, nation state builders in Ukraine really try to think about what to do and there were so many, this is what I mean about the self-reflection. It's if, if, if it's just intelligentsia and elites doing it um, and considering and writing eloquent essays about it, I'm not even academics. I'm not sure it's going to be great. I think the best research that we now know was so right for so many years about Ukraine is the research that just talked to ordinary citizens about how they viewed their own identity. And here... It was very clear that Ukrainians viewed their own identity in civic terms for now the last few decades. Again, a lot of research has shown that. But that's what Zelensky understood in 2019. Um, he was, he understood that identity because he was part of that community. So there was no need to build it. He was just a reflection in a mirror of what ordinary citizens were already saying in a variety of ways. And if you look now with the lens of 2022 at his Kvartal shows, you will see that he has constantly made ridiculous jokes and the humor that I do not find to be funny at all, but reflections on civic identity throughout. And those were some of the things that people gave the biggest laughs to, especially when it was reflections on civil, civic identity of Ukrainians versus Russian uh, nationalism. Right. So uh, speaking to ordinary citizens, I think, is the most important thing here. Um, okay. That's uh, actually fantastic. Very important. Like, did, you, did you want to add more, Olga? Or is that? No, no, no. no. I think that's fine. Yeah. OK. Um, it just because I'm looking at the chat, I mean, it's been populated with a lot of um, questions, uh, but just perhaps on, on, on the matter or on the issue of language as a marker. You know, I lived uh, uh, for uh, for a while in Wales, and um, in order to differentiate and in order to boost its identity, it was very interesting to see that actually Welsh language was made state uh, official language uh, within the state, which means that everyone would speak Welsh, and it was very interesting how defensive they were about the issue of language because language helped them to kind of to transmit, broadcast their identity to, to the newcomers so much so that, uh, you know, people who were arriving from outside, they, they were, uh, you know, we had to communicate in both languages. So uh, including at the university, which was very interesting. So the issue of language is clearly important, but I think possibly as a way of self-reflection too, rather than bringing it uh, forth front as it happened in 1990s, which uh, kind of alienated a lot of people to start with in Belarus. Uh, Veronica, you, you raised your hand. Um, do you want to add? Yes, I just wanted to, um, to uh, follow up on what have been said by my, what has been said by my colleagues, Alexander and uh, Olga. Uh, I think that um, 
what what is meant when we are saying that Ukrainians do not build Russians very well is the very fact that it's what was happening before 2020, Olga. It is indeed true that Ukrainians were covering extremely well uh, what was happening in Belarus since 2020. But before that, I have also lived in Ukraine in, in different cities. I have also studied Ukraine for more than 10 years. So I know it also quite well. And I can tell you that Ukrainians were absolutely in love with Lukashenko, with his regime, with what was happening. <laughs> So it was changing, it started to change after the protests and a great job was done by many of my colleagues who work in Ukrainian media, who were calling all of us and speaking to us and trying to understand how it is happening. There's so many people are protesting against Lukashenko. But um, this is what we mean when we speak about the lack of knowledge of what is happening in Belarus. And this is what I also mean that uh, it might be uh, seen, also I see this in the questions that some top of uh, some type of uh, self reflections and proper discussion is happening in Belarus. No, during all these years of dictatorship, uh, not only knowledge inside Belarus, but outside Belarus was uh, very much frozen and isolated. Not many people were talking about Belarus, not many people were paying attention. I can tell you that now I'm working with archives on Belarus in Washington. Nobody has ever touched them, no one. They're not digitized. Everything which is in Belarusian and which was laying there for more than 20 years, it's not touched. And that is why we need so much research to be done on that. And we need indeed to bring it into a very wide perspective, not just among intellectuals, we are not speaking about this, but among people. We need media to popularize what is happening in Ukraine and Belarus. We need this exchange, which is very much needed. And I also think that... Um, uh, when you are speaking, Olga, about Belarusians saying, oh, we don't want Maidan, we are not nationalists. This is also propaganda, which was uh, very much conveyed by uh, Russians and um, very much by Belarusian state television and state media, uh, because uh, Belarusians were not focusing on what were Ukrainians doing, what uh, were Russians, they were focused very much on themselves. The, those protests and what was happening now, it's about them, it's about us. And that is why I think it's wonderful we're having this discussion today, because we can put these little components and exchange opinions and inspire each other for this further discussion and further processes. And uh, I'm extremely looking forward to uh, our further discussion with our Ukrainian colleagues. Uh, and I would like uh, them to understand us, and I would really like us to understand them. And I think at this point, as we are uh, also speaking during the days of the war in Ukraine, it's, it's even more important that we stay connected together, we hear each other, we understand each other, and we are open to each other's uh, opinions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. And unfortunately, we, we've run out of time. Um, and uh, I would like to apologize to our audience um, uh, for the fact that we couldn't, we didn't really have time to pick up and answer your questions. But on the good side, on the positive side, we are going to continue our discussion uh, next Thursday. This time, actually, co-jointly with the Center for International um, Studies in Berlin. So Gwen Sasser, with whom Olga uh, also conducted um, some of these surveys, I understand. So we will continue that discussion. So please, please, please join us because we need to discuss and understand what really can propel us to a much bit better state of affairs and what kind of knowledge we actually need, what, what do we need to learn about each other uh, in order to construct um, our um, identity uh, as, as imaginary uh, for, for the future. But in what is left now, I just would like to thank our panelists for their absolutely amazing, um, insightful, uh, commentary and interventions and I look forward to continuing this discussion uh, next time so please join us thank you thank you very much everyone it was a great pleasure thank you so much bye bye thank you bye bye thank you